One of the most exciting aspects of writing and even reading fiction is the world in which the characters live. Is it a world where a badass heiress upholds her father's archaeological legacy by raiding tombs? Is it a world where a post-apocalyptic London has been ravaged by dragons? Or is it a war between the modern descendants of Templar Knights and a brotherhood of hooded assassins? We're going to be looking at how to take familiar elements and transform them into an imaginative new experience. I'm your host, Garrett K. Jones, and we are continuing our Season 5 deep dive into exploring elements of world building. back to the right way. We have a great episode in store for you guys with this week's content, but before we jump into this month's writing tips, there are a couple of special announcements. First and foremost, I have another writing workshop focused on writing westerns coming up in mid-July. I'll also be participating in another author meet and greet at the Kings County Library in August, and then in September, I have uh, an appearance that I'm going to be making at a uh, comic convention up in Clovis, California. So those are some dates that I'll be presenting uh, during next week's first video of July, just so that you guys are in the know. Secondly, as Season 5 is getting closer and closer to its end date, I want to make sure that you guys are reminded that if you're a published author, I am looking to fill interview spots for Season 6. Even if I've interviewed you in the past, I would love for you to return and be a guest on the show and talk about whatever projects you have and are ready for readers to read. Now, if you have been interviewed and you don't want to be interviewed again, I am also looking to schedule returning authors as guest presenters for the top 10 book recommendations videos at the start of each month. The signups for both segments are available right now, so please feel free to sign up. It's free. Uh, and I would love to have you guys, but now let's get on with the show. World building is one of the most crucial aspects of writing. We're going to continue looking at Ellen Brock's world-building Bible template and applying it through the lens of Avatar The Last Airbender. In May, we examined what the Avatar's world looks like by exploring religion, tech, and magic. This month, in June, we are tackling three more categories from the 21 that Brock listed. Today, we are covering family, education, and language. Let's dive in, shall we? Family. 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 Family can be a crucial element, not just in world building, but also in how your characters develop and interact with the world. It's also the dominant theme for the Fast Saga. Family. 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 Brock gives us 10 bullet points, which include typical marriage age, typical number of children, typical family dynamic and structure, attitudes towards children, attitudes towards the elderly, attitudes towards romantic love, care for the elderly, care for children, gender roles, and the importance of birth order for the sake of family roles and inheritance. All of these bullet points are explored in Avatar, and it's all there in front of the audience, even if it's not explicit. We get the sense that most characters get married in their late teens or early 20s, and usually for love. The best example we get of something more organized are with the betrothal necklaces employed by the water tribes, which do allow for some level of agency from the women accepting it, like an engagement ring, and the Fire Nation, where many marriages are arranged. Many family structures are nuclear, meaning the parents 
are involved and they have at least a couple of children. You do see larger families, but not many. There seems to be a great deal of love given towards the elderly, as is the case with Sokka and Katara for their grand-grand, and there is a reciprocated feeling from parents for their children throughout most of the world. Even Iroh is a prime example of someone who resigns from actively fighting in the Hundred Years' War after the death of his son Luten, whom we see get honored in the anniversary of his death by Iroh in Season 2. The real disparity in the dynamic is in the line of active Fire Lords. Zuko and Azula are practically neglected and abused by Ozai, even if he favors Azula. His wife, Ursa, loves both her children, but dotes on Zuko to balance the abuse from Ozai, even going so far as to kill her father-in-law to protect Zuko when Azulon orders Zuko's death. Azulon was just as cruel with his own children, which is reflected in how Ozai behaved. We never see how Fire Lord Sozin parented, but it probably wasn't great given the harshness of Azulon's character. We do see the importance of birth order play some impact in the series. As the older brother and one of the last young men in his village of, of warrior age, Sokka feels responsible for caring for his younger sister as part of a promise he made to his father. Along the way, he learns to understand that she's far from helpless. But we also see this dynamic play out twofold in the Fire Nation. Ozai requested he be made his father's successor over the older Iroh because he felt that Iroh wasn't fit to lead. This is why Azulon ordered Zuko's death so Ozai could experience the loss his brother had at that point. And as a point of pride, Ozai favored the younger Azula as his prodigy because he thought of Zuko as weak. Gender roles play some part in Avatar's storytelling. As mentioned last month, Katara wasn't allowed to initially train in true water bending because the Northern Tribe relegated female benders to learning healing only. She challenged that notion and earned herself a place in Master Paku's classes. Azula becomes one of the Fire Nation's chief military leaders as a 14-year-old girl, beating several accomplished, far older male tacticians for the position. Even Toph eschews traditional gender roles by doing the underground earthbending matches and joining with the Avatar. In fact, through most of the series, most of the earthbenders we see are male. That isn't to say there aren't female earthbenders, they just don't seem to pop up nearly as much in the series. So, here is tip number one. Play with these family dynamics and gender roles because they help push and test the social and cultural norms of the world that you've already established. World building isn't just about establishing the rules of your world, it's also about making it feel lived in and putting things and characters into a position where uh, rules might be bent and or broken. Especially since families are usually the first sources of education many people get. Culture, morals, religion, skills and trades have been traditionally taught first in the home. And this does bring us to education. Brock provides us with six bullet points, which include typical education level, school subjects, school environment, availability, cost, and restrictions. In Avatar, we see each of these in play to some degree. Most people in the series don't have a formal education, but that doesn't mean that they're unintelligent by any means. We see water bending schools in the Northern Water Tribe devoted to true bending for the male students and warriors, while the ladies focus on healing. This also doubles as a restriction based on gender. We also see bending schools in the Earth Kingdom, but we also see more formal education, such as universities and the private school that Aang attends for a day in the Fire Nation. More than likely, these are private institutions and are thus probably expensive given the uniform requirements Aang had to follow. Though the Fire Nation school didn't even bother to check their records to see if Aang even was who he said he was, and just accepted his fib that he came from the colonies. Wealthy families might hire private tutors for their children like the Beifongs did to hide the shame, quote unquote, of Toph's blindness from the world. Most of the school environments we see in Avatar focus on specific skills associated with bending or calligraphy or fighting or music. We are told about the Bossing Se University, but never see it. But the fields of study there are far more academic, though I'm sure it's just as structured and strict. We've also encountered restrictions on education with the gender segregation used by the Northern Water Tribe 
regarding bedding, and we've talked about that ad nauseum already. So here is writing tip number dos. Develop the education systems of your world with emphasis on who can learn, what they can learn, how it's paid for, and the student's age ranges. If you are writing something modern day, there are plenty of examples of education to pull from. If you're basing it on something historic, make sure you do your research. If you're creating the education system from scratch, make sure to focus on the tip that I recommended. Our last topic for this month is language. This is something that is intrinsic to families and cultures, but can also be taught in education as well, whether you're snoozing through Spanish 3 or you're learning Japanese from Rosetta Stone. Languages are key components of world building because they help provide the means of dialogue or challenges in dialogue because of language barriers for your characters. Brock gives us only four bullet points to focus on. Primary and major languages, regional and minor languages, prevalence of polyglots, those are people who speak more than one language, and colloquialisms, slang, and curses. In Avatar, everybody seems to speak the same language despite cultures and geographic distances. We don't know what it's translated from and the dialogue uses modern slang to a point, which is just so fetch if you're a kid watching a fun cartoon. Stop trying to make fetch happen. It's not going to happen. Languages can be tricky because most authors aren't J.R.R. Tolkien and they are not linguists in any sense of the word. If you're setting something in the real world, whether historical or modern or set in the future, there are plenty of languages for you to pull from. And depending on the time period, you can have a lot of fun playing with and adapting slang. But if you're writing something out of this world in fantasy or some kind of alien language, then you're going to want to be a bit more flexible. Either way, make Google Translate and BehindTheName.com your best friends. This is writing tip number three, in fact. Use these websites regularly to help you develop the language or languages that your characters speak. This particular tip comes from my own experiences more than a summation of the language bullet points that we're looking at. Since I don't have the practical skills for creating uh, a, a an original language, what I have done is use real existing languages as the basis. For instance, while the basic tongue in my world is English, the elf language uh, is a based on uh, French and Italian or a mixture of French and Italian. What I will end up doing is I will translate a word or phrase into both languages and then kind of pick and choose which letters and uh, syllables I want to use on that. The vampires in my series have a language that is based on Castilian Spanish. Fangs, lisping, you get the picture. And dragons speak something that is based on Latin. This was deliberate because the languages and histories of these four races are very intertwined. I actually will write a phrase in English, translate it into its respective language base, and tweak the accent marks, as I said before, if any tweaks are necessary. Uh, as well as change letters and uh, portmanteau words. For example, uh, the title of my series, uh, The Archives of Isink Rain, the word Isink Rain comes from French for Il Cinq Rain, which translates The Five Kingdoms. Uh, as for using Behind the Name, which is an etymology website, names for places and people are derived from their native language and are typically used to help describe a character. I'm a fan of using names that make sense and fit, and knowing a name's meaning can help with that because it helps develop the character. Having worked in education, I've encountered kids whose parents clearly name them something to sound unique, but it either looks ridiculously complicated, like the spelling of Elijah as U-H-L-Y-E-J-U-H, which is very, I don't know, phonetic in its design, but it's way too many letters. Or naming your daughter something abstract like princess when she acts neither royal nor with any kind of dignity. Also, it's not, new, it's not unique to name your kid unique. Trust me. So that is it for June. Tip one, play with the family dynamics and gender roles. Tip two, develop the education systems of your world with emphasis on who can learn, what they can learn, and how it's paid for, and the student's age ranges. And tip number three, make sure to use 
the Google Translate and behind the name websites to help you generate languages and decent character and place names to improve your world building. Follow these tips as they make sense for your writing to craft the world that your characters are going to inhabit. Hey, thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications on new videos. You can support this channel and what we do on Patreon and the merch store. Those links can be found down in the video description. And make sure to tune in next week for the July Top 10 list. Looking forward to seeing you then.